you got to know what the wisdom of God is and then stand in who you are in Christ Jesus. And if the world laughs, let it laugh because you know who you are in Christ. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Let's get right into our Bible study. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And if you are dexterous enough, uh, you can also find Acts 18. Uh, if, you, if you go to 1 Corinthians and then hang a left, go back to Romans, and then before that, the book of Acts, and you can find Acts 18 as well, because I'm going to be actually starting in Acts 18 as the background to the book of 1 Corinthians. But Every time we begin a new book study, and if you're new to Cornerstone, we just go generally straight through the Bible, cover to cover, and we're starting now into the book of 1 Corinthians, and so a little background of this book and a little background on the city of Corinth I thought would be helpful to kind of uh, set the stage. And so this book, 1 Corinthians, was written by Paul, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He wrote this book around the year 56 AD. It was a letter to the church that he planted about five years before he wrote this letter. So a little bit about Corinth, the city itself, because it, it kind of helps us to understand the dynamics of the people that uh, made up this first church. Uh, Corinth was an important port city of Greece, and it was the Roman capital for that particular region. Remember, this is first century, this is Roman Empire. There were around 700,000 people who lived in Corinth during the time of the first century AD when Paul visited there. But please note, most of that population was slaves. F about 500,000 made up slaves. It was more than twice the population of the, of the freed population. Roman citizens made up about 200,000. And, um, and, and of course, slavery was part of the downfall of the Roman Empire. And so we see Corinth as a major metropolis with the slave population twice as much as the Roman citizen population. It was an extremely immoral city. Uh, there were 12 temples that dotted the landscape of Corinth. The most important one to them was the temple of Aphrodite. That's the Greek goddess of love and sex. The Romans called her Venus. And about a thousand temple prostitutes, male and female, were employed at any particular time in the service at the Temple of Aphrodite. And so it really made the Temple of Aphrodite more of a religious house of prostitution than anything else. So this is that climate, this is that social environment. And out of this is gonna be birthed a, a church um, where believers come to faith in Jesus Christ that Paul plants. So when you, when you look at this backdrop here, it's no wonder that Paul decided, you know what, God's calling me to go to Corinth. I need to start a church there. People need to hear the gospel. They need to know about Jesus at a city like Corinth. So he first traveled there around 51 AD, writes this letter, as I said, about 56 AD. And Acts 18 actually gives us the story behind Paul's visit to Corinth, his first visit to Corinth, and how this church got started. So uh, we will come to 1 Corinthians, but if you, if you want to uh, hang a left and go to Acts 18, let me just read with you uh, the first uh, few verses of Acts chapter 18 so you can see a, the backdrop to uh, this letter to the church at Corinth. So in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 11, I'll read, and it explains Paul's first visit there to this uh, well, rather hedonistic city at the time, of course. And so Acts 18, this is verse 1. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, that's, that was the Roman emperor at the time, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he and he came to them, Paul came to them. And so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And notice where Paul went first to the synagogue. And it says in verse five that when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. 
And then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there, Paul did, a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So we can pause there. So when Paul gets to Corinth, he goes first to the Jews. Now that was his custom. He goes first to the Jews. He shares with them about Yeshua, about Jesus as Messiah. Unfortunately, as was most often the case, uh, the Jews here in Corinth rejected his message, rejected him. So he shook the dust off of his garments and he went next door to the synagogue, was a house by the, uh, that owned by the name of a guy, Justice. Justice like believed in God. There are a lot of people who like believe in God, but they, they haven't connected the dots about Jesus and salvation through faith in him. So Paul goes to Justice's house and, and there it says in verse eight, Verse eight says, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So this is the genesis of the church at Corinth that starts here in Justice's house after having gone first to the Jews who didn't receive it. Now, some, some will later, but this is the beginning of the church here at Corinth. And Paul will stay there, the text tells us, for 18 months. He's going to disciple them. He's going to teach them the scriptures. He's going to mentor them in, the, in their young faith, which is very important. It's critical when people come to faith in Jesus that they take time to really grow in that relationship, understand what that means, are, are, are discipled in their faith. And so Paul spends a year and a half, which is not typical, um, except with the, for the exception of Ephesus, where he stayed for three years. Paul generally would just plant a church spend just a little bit of time, move on, plant a church, spend a little time, move on. But here in Corinth, he spends a year and a half and he's investing in them. Well, that investment uh, doesn't seem to be growing very well because they stay in a state of immaturity. And five years later, five years after he plants this church, Paul is going to write them a letter here, this letter, 1 Corinthians, which is basically a corrective epistle. Because as you'll see here in a minute, they're just doing some things that are, that are wild and wacky. And, uh, and so let's go now to 1 Corinthians before we pray. And I'll read the first nine verses from chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll read the first nine verses. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who, are, who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Verse seven, note this, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the resurrection, or rather the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pause there and pray. Father God, it is good to be in your house today. It is good to open our Bibles and to just settle our hearts before you and to just open ourselves to what you would say to us today. We are glad to be in your house. We are glad, Lord, to be in your presence. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We continue to pray for things in our country, Lord, that you would work in sovereign ways to accomplish your good purposes. We thank you for the privilege of living in America. We ask you, Lord, to help us as believers to continue to pray for our country, for all of our leaders. And thank you for this time in your word now. We just love you. We, we thank you that you first loved us and sent Jesus to die on a cross for us. We commit this to you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, as I alluded to in the introduction, the Corinthian church was a very complicated group of people. On the one hand, they were very spiritual. 
as we'll see. On the other hand, they were pretty worldly. Uh, on the spiritual side, it tells us there in verse 7 that they did not lack any spiritual gift. And we'll get later here into the book of Corinthians, which talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit. So they, they had words of knowledge going, they had tongues and interpretation, they had gifts of healing. And, and yet, Paul's going to tell them in chapter 12, they've been misusing some of those gifts. So he even has to correct them on the usage of spiritual gifts. But it was a happening place in terms of the Spirit of God. So it was, there was a very spiritual environment to the church at Corinth. There was also a very worldly environment. And, and the two were mixed and should never be, but that was also descriptive of the church here at Corinth. And he even tells us, Paul does in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I couldn't even address you people as spiritual. I have to address you as carnal, or some translations say worldly. He says, you guys have not gone on to maturity. Um, I, you know, I feel like I have to treat you like, like baby Christians. And, and he calls them out on some of these worldly things that, that, that have crept back into the church. And, and so again, this is, this is more of a corrective epistle than anything else. And we, we learn that actually there are two reasons why Paul writes this letter. The first reason, if you're taking notes, the first reason is to answer questions that they had written to him about. And we're going to see as we make our way through this book, they had questions about biblical marriage in chapter 7, verse 1. Paul begins to answer that question. And remember, this is first century Roman Empire. The idea of marriage was a very twisted and distorted uh, institution during the time of the Roman Empire. They, they uh, not only had legal marriage, but they also tolerated concubines. And listen, this is so tragic, but many of you know this about Roman history. They even tolerated pedophilia. And so the Roman Empire was a very just uh, debased kind of a culture that was engaging in all kinds of immoral things. So when you're called out of that because you get saved, you might have some questions about what is marriage supposed to look like? So that was one of their questions. They also had questions about uh, lifestyle liberties. What things can we do? What things can we not do? Paul mentions that in chapter 8. They also had questions about spiritual gifts, which they should, because Paul's going to tell them in chapter 12 through 14 that they're misusing some of these gifts. And then they had questions about financial offerings. What is expected for them to give to the church? When? How much? All of that. So they have four specific questions. So some of that is the reason why he's writing this letter to address those questions. The other reason that he writes this letter is to correct them for what they were doing wrong. And he's going to call them out for divisions and quarreling in chapter 3. He's going to call them out for sexual sin that they are tolerating in chapter 5. He's going to call them out for suing each other. Can you believe this? I mean, like not, nothing has changed, ladies and gentlemen. They were, they were taking people to court. They were suing each other. Uh, that's chapter 6. They were getting drunk at communion. I mean, you know, we're going to have communion today, but we don't have the real stuff. We have grape juice, okay? They had the real stuff. They were getting three sheets to the wind every time they're having communion. They're like, praise God, you know, and they're like, oh, praise the Lord. This is wonderful. And so they're doing that, and then they're misusing spiritual gifts. So Paul's going to correct them on all this. He goes, you guys are, you guys are like, it's a freak show. He said, well, what in the world? You guys are like University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, just... <laughs> which by the way is the number one party school, look it up. But anyway, that's the only reason I mention that. But so, so they're a mess, they're a mess, and he has to correct them. They were a moral mess and they were a confused congregation. And so the question becomes, why were they so spiritually immature? Now, five years may not seem that much, but you know, Paul invested a year and a half with them. So they should have been more spiritually mature than they are. And what he's going to end up telling us is there are a few reasons why they have been spiritually stunted. And we're going to notice them here right in chapter one. And the first one is when you, when you ask the question, why was the church in Corinth spiritually immature? The first reason is because they made idols out of leaders. They made idols out of leaders. You're never going to go on with the Lord if you're fixated and enamored with people too much. And, and, and so I want you to read with me here, 1 Corinthians 1, let's pick up where we left off at verse 10. And this is what he says in verse 10. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that just means like get unified, 
and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, like I've heard, and here's how he heard, by those of Chloe's household. So there were some snitches in Chloe's house. And they're like, Paul, you need to know what's going on here. Well, good for them, because Paul, Paul needed to know this. He says, it's been told that there are contentions among you. Verse 12, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Like he says, you know, I didn't keep a list. I, I don't know how many people I baptized, but not very many. In verse 17, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, let me just comment on that last part there, because there are some circles within Christianity that say that baptism is required for salvation. That is not true. You add anything to the cross, you add anything to faith alone in Christ alone, and you've made it a works-oriented religion. And it is what separates Christianity from all other world religions. All other world religions emphasize some aspect of what you need to do to work your way to some higher state. It's what you need to do to work your way up to God. Christianity says it's what God has done to come down to us. And so you, you don't add anything to faith in, in, in Christ alone. And so if baptism, water baptism, were required for salvation, Paul would not have shrugged it off like this. Paul would not have said, you know, I baptized a few people. I, I, don't, I don't even remember because Christ did not call me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Guarantee if baptism was a requirement salvation for, for salvation, that Christ would have called him to baptize everybody that he led to the Lord in, in faith to Jesus. So um, look, baptism is an external sign of an internal work, but it is not required for salvation. And Paul separates the two right there. He goes, I didn't, I, now the reason he's saying this about, I didn't, I didn't baptize a lot of people is, is because people here in the church are having popularity contests. And, and some of them are like, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. Look, look, can you imagine if Paul had been known for baptizing a lot of people, how there would have been this, this competition among folks who would have had this conversation, like, who baptized you? Who baptized you? Oh, the, Crispus, Crispus baptized me. Sounds like a cereal, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you know who baptized me? The Apostle Paul. That's who baptized me. The Apostle Paul, you know? And so, and so Paul's like, hey, don't put emphasis on me. I'm just glad I haven't even baptized a bunch of people. By the way, you who know your Bibles, how many people did Jesus baptize? Zero. Can you imagine if you had been baptized by Jesus? I mean, you've been walking around like, you know, where's my T-shirt? I was baptized by Jesus. <laughs> Who'd you have? John the Baptist? <laughs> I had Jesus. You know, so... Look, Paul is calling out here a problem. And the problem is that people had started showing their loyalty and affection for a person instead of for the Lord. Paul says, you're going around saying, I'm of Paul, myself, he, he means. He said, you're going around saying, I am of Apollos. Apollos was a very eloquent speaker of the early church, led many to Christ. I am of Cephas. Cephas is the Hebrew name for Peter. Peter's the Greek derivation of his name. And then he goes, and some are saying, I am of Christ. And he's rebuking them because the answer is, everybody should be saying, I am of Christ, not I am of one of the, these guys. And so people had their favorites and, and they were boasting about their favorites instead of Christ. And they're not gonna go on to maturity in Jesus as long as they are idolizing a man. And Paul underscores this, go over a couple chapters to chapter three, where he basically says the same thing, but I just wanna read it to you in chapter three. First few verses in chapter three, verse one, he says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal or worldly, 
As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, you're still worldly. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not being worldly? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers... The literal word is servants through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Friends, pastors and church leaders are subject to the same kind of failings as you are. The only difference is we are held to a higher standard of accountability. Tragically, tragically, many notable leaders have fallen over the years, some prominent ones very recently. I don't need to mention their names. The point is, please keep your eyes on the one who will never fail you nor disappoint you, and his name is Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on him. Don't make an idol out of a person. You know, I'm very touched by complimentary things that people say to me, but please don't go around saying, I am of Gary Hamrick. I am, I am of Jack Hibbs. I am of Franklin Graham. Go around saying, I am of Jesus Christ. Make that your mantra. You, you can say, I listen to their teachings, but say, I am of Christ and pray for us. Pray for us, pastors. Pray for the pastors here at Cornerstone. Pray for pastors at every church. I was just uh, texting with Pastor Jack Hibbs this morning. It was 7 a.m. my time, it was 4 a.m. his time. I'm like, bro, like, what are you doing? But he's, he's up early praying, ready to preach. And we, we both were just commenting about how we have felt the enemy just attacking us over the past several weeks in different ways. Nothing sinful, but just, you know, the enemy can work on people in, in ways to just get you down or discourage or whatever the case might be. And, um, and so I, I, I know that um, the enemy works hard and the, the enemy works hard on the leaders because, look, he knows that if he can pick off the leaders, it will affect the larger body. So we need your prayers, friends. We need your prayers. So that was the first issue he calls him out on. He's like, stop going around saying, I'm of a Paul, I'm of Apollos. But the other issue here was that, number two, that they allowed the wisdom, quote, of the world to influence the way they lived. Now, this is not uncommon. And I say it's not uncommon because when people are used to living a certain way, thinking a certain way, believing a certain way, behaving a certain way, and then they come to faith in Christ, it, it can be difficult to shake off the old way that you thought, believed, and behaved. You, you've been perhaps for years, especially if you come to faith in Christ later in life, you for years have believed a certain way, talked a certain way, behaved a certain way, and then all of a sudden your life is transformed and, and there's almost a shock effect because when you look back, you're like, I can't believe I believed that way. I can't believe I... I was persuaded by the culture to think that this or that was true at the time. Your eyes are open when you come to know Christ, and, and yet the problem can be, and this was the problem in the Corinthian church, is that they had not shaken off some of those worldly philosophies and the worldly way of thinking. And, and this is what Paul says here. Look again further in chapter 1, verse 18, where he starts talking about how there is a wisdom there's a wisdom that the world calls wise, and then there's a wisdom from above, God's wisdom. And he said, these are, these are very different philosophies and wisdoms. And so this is what he goes on to write here. This is verse 18 of chapter 1. He says in verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
Jump on over to verse 27, further down to verse 27. He says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh may should glory in his presence. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, let me just translate this a little bit. He speaks here about there's an earthly, worldly wisdom, and then there's a heavenly wisdom. And Paul says, you better know the difference, and you better tap into the wisdom of God, because it will often be in conflict with, quote, the wisdom of the world. And the people of the world who think they're so smart will look at God's wisdom and look at Christians and think you're so foolish, especially the cross. To an unbelieving world, the cross looks like foolishness. Why, if God so loved the world, would he actually allow a son to die on a cross for our sins? That sounds foolish until you believe it and accept it, and then you know it's liberating. And you know it's the wisdom of God who has condescended to our level to rescue us. So there are two different kinds of, quote, wisdom. The word wise or wisdom is found 30 times in the book of 1 Corinthians, 27 of those times in the first three chapters. He has a lot to say in the first three chapters about wisdom because people are going around being persuaded by what the world says is wise or what the world says is true. And folks, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize how crazy the world has become. It's either that or I am tapping more into the wisdom of God to be able to see how crazy the world is. Maybe it's been there always. Of course, it has to some degree, but it seems to have been ratcheted up in the last few years where you and I are being expected to believe things that are complete nonsense, to believe things that accept things that like even just five, 10 years ago, we would have realized uh, are, are insane. In fact, there are some things that used to be in the psychiatric diagnostic manual as mental illness now being embraced and celebrated just from a few years ago. And so, you know, what has changed? Well, what has changed is the culture and social norms has veered in a different direction. You know, when people ask me sometimes, why is it you seem to have gotten, you know, more, of, more like conservative or more political stuff? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I've been standing in the same place for 30 plus years reading out of the same book. I've stood in the same place reading from the same book. It's the culture that has veered far left and it makes people like you and me look like we're, we're crazy people. No, I'm sorry. It's the wisdom of God from the wisdom of God's word and may it keep us grounded. Let the world laugh at what what we think is true and right. We know what is true and right. They're gonna mock you. They're gonna try to shame you if they haven't already canceled you because the world doesn't like the wisdom of God until they open their hearts to accept it. And then it can be transforming. And I've heard that too. Wonderful testimonies of people who, who have said to me things like, you know, I, I used to be uh, for abortion, then I got saved, and I actually saw how God is the author of life, and I've changed my view on that. Yeah, praise God. I mean, He can change our views because He changes our hearts. And when He changes us from the inside, it will affect the different ways that we live out our lives. And so the world's going to look at you sometimes and they're going to say, why do you raise your kids that way? Why do you manage your money that way? Why, why are you trying to reconcile with your spouse after what he or she did to you? You know, and they're going to spew all kinds of things at you and try to make you think like you're foolish. Listen, listen to me on this. The problem in the Corinthian church was just that. They had entertained the worldly things. And Paul says, you got to come out from that stuff. You got to know what the wisdom of God is and then stand in who you are in Christ Jesus. And if the world laughs, let it laugh because you know who you are in Christ. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's break bread together with communion. So ushers, if you'd come. We're going to close our service with communion now. Let's pray first. Father in heaven, we thank you today for the gift of Jesus Christ. 
I pray, Lord, for those who don't know him here in the service or watching online, that they would open their hearts to the truth that Jesus came, died on a cross for our sins, offers us a relationship with him so we can have our sins forgiven and know that we're going to heaven when we die. It sounds like foolishness to an unbelieving world, but to those of us who believe and have received, it is the wisdom of heaven, the grace of God, the mercy from above. Thank you, God, that you love us so much, that you saw us in our sinfulness and you desired to rescue us. So we right now remember the cross. We remember the price that Christ paid and we're so grateful. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, that you would save sinners like us. And so as the elements are distributed, Lord, we just pray that this would be a, a sober reminder of our sins and of Christ's righteousness and how you have imputed to us that righteousness if we would but by faith accept you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.